Calispera says. C can you hear me? It doesn't sound like this is on. It's on. What song would you like to hear tonight? <laughs> no, as Debbie says, I have other gifts. That's not one of them. So good, good to see you all. Welcome, Calispera says, Carlos Irthate, to this fourth annual Artemis Azariadis Memorial Lecture. This lecture has been, this lecture series has been endowed by Professor Costas and Mrs. Asimo Azariadis in memory of their daughter Artemis. Um, we are extremely grateful to you and your family for your generosity. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, for because of a conflict at the St. Louis Art Museum, their daughter Kelly and their son-in-law Simon, uh, sorry, their daughter Cleo and their son-in-law Simon Kelly had to be at the Art Museum. And also, of course, Juliana, the, their, their granddaughter, so they could not be here tonight. Um, however, we are very honored to have you with us. Thank you so much again for endowing this lecture series. Costas and Ansimo have been wonderful friends of the Greek professorship and Greek studies for many years now. And we are truly blessed to have friends like the Azariadises and also the Pelicans. Dr. George Pelican is here. Where is he? I just saw him. He went out, of course. Anyway, and Alexandra Pelican, his daughter is here. Uh, She's here, um, Michael and Alki Case, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Dino Michaelidis with so many wonderful friends, Scott Thompson, Katya, Nana. Uh, we are very honored also to have the chair of the history department, Professor Laura Westcott here, and Kevin Fertlund, a professor of history, and uh, there he is, and many students. Uh, some of you are my students, but I don't know you because this is an online course, so please come and find me at the end. I would love to get to meet you in person. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Artemis Leontis. Professor Leontis is the Konstantin Kavafi Chair in Modern Greek Studies at the University of Michigan. She is also a professor of Greek language and literature and a professor of comparative literature. Professor Leondis uh, received her BA at Oberlin College, and then she went on to receive her master's and PhD at Ohio State University, and also did postgraduate work at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Since 1999, when he she started to teach at the University of Michigan, she has taught a wide range of courses on Greek history, language, culture, uh, and literature. Her research interests are far and wide ranging, uh, but if there is one, they're all about modern Greece, and if there is one particular thread that runs through her research, her research is how Greeks and foreigners perceive Greek identity, the construction of Greek identity and the perception of Greek identity within the fr larger framework of social and cultural uh, studies. Um, her first book, Topographies of Hellenism, Mapping the Homeland, was a landmark study in how Westerners see Greece, how modern Greeks see Greece, and how modern Greeks see the Westerners' views of Greece. So her work lies at the intersection of literature and culture. Her other books, Culture and uh, Customs of Greece, her, her, her other book, Culture and Customs of Greece, is a major reference book about modern, Greeks, uh, modern Greek uh, culture within the framework of monuments and landmarks in Greece. Uh, her most recent work is on Eva Palmer Sikelianos, this American poetess and artist who married the famed Greek poet Angelo, Angelos Sikelianos, and she was a driving force with him behind the revival of uh, the uh, Pythian games and the, Olf the uh, Delphic um, um, uh, games in, in Delphi. Uh, and it's a also a study at how uh, some brilliant figures of our culture who are, do not really conform with the norms of society operate and function within the wider culture. She has also edited other volumes on Kavafi and also an anthology of modern Greek literature in translation for travelers to Greece, a sort of an introduction into modern Greek culture through Greek literature. 
One of her projects is um, the way that women, children, and, uh, of and non combatant population, uh, the, the fate of this non combatant population at times of war, especially within refugees, within the framework of, of refugee studies. And today's talk, uh, taking as a departure point the Greek War of Independence in 1822 and Dionysius Solomos, the national poet of Greece, will address exactly this issue, especially how women refugees were affected by the brutality of the war. Professor Leontis, it, it is an honor for us to have you here. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're all yours. So good evening. Can you hear me all right? All right. And um, I want to begin with a note of thanks, um, gratitude, first of all, uh, to the donors of the lecture, um, uh, Artemis, uh, Artemis, forgive me, um, Artemis Azariadis, your, uh, your late daughter. What a great gift to honor her with a lecture that will be in in perpetuity in this, um, in this university. I can't think of a better way to remember um, someone and, uh, and I am sure that you experience the feeling of loss every single day, but this is also a gain for everyone around us. So thank you very much. I'm very honored to give this lecture in her memory. Uh, I want to thank Professor Michael Kosmopoulos for inviting me and for your um, beautiful hospitality and the honor of being here and also uh, to say how much I appreciate the work that you've done in building the program here together with members of the community, a very dynamic uh, group of people. I think it's a really rare thing to accomplish something so big and to do it in um, coordination with people in the community. Uh, and I know what the work is like and I can just see it happening. So. Um, so what a great honor to be here, and thank you to all of you who've come. Um, and congratulations for the work that you've done. So um, I'm going to take on this subject of the writing of Dionysios Solomos, uh, who is, as Michael said, um, Greece's national poet. And I'm going to talk about him from an angle that hasn't been observed before, but touches on our reality. And it's also really connected with my interest in thinking about people who, about the relationship between Greece and foreigners and, um, and people who are bicultural, uh, people who move between cultures. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about Dionysio Solomos in the way that people know him in Greece. Uh, and then I think introduce some aspects of him that are less known. So if I was giving this talk in Greece today, I wouldn't start by presenting basic facts uh, about Dionysio Solomos, and I'm sure that there are people in this audience who don't need them, uh, he, that for whom he doesn't need an introduction. Um, can I move the slide? Are we all right? And can you hear me all right? Is the, okay, all right. So um, even students in primary and secondary schools in Greece know that Solomos is the national poet of Greece and some of the following facts about him. Uh, so, Solomos was born Dionysio Salamon uh, in 1897 in Zakynthos, in the Ionian Islands, when the islands were still part of the Venetian Republic, just barely, because the Venetian Republic collapsed that year. He and his younger brother, Dimitrios, were illegitimate sons of Count Nikolaos Salamon, and his servant, Angeliki Niki. Count Solomon married Miss Niki after his wife died, just a day before his own death, in time to acknowledge Dionysios as his heir. Solomos was tutored in Italian and moved to Italy. Let's see. So here we have the, uh, I have to remember to move the slides. Here we have the uh, Republic of Venice, and it includes the Ionian Islands. Uh, which are on the west coast of what is today Greece. And uh, this is the house of Count Nicolaos Salomon in Zakynthos, 
And then here you can see uh, where Zeigenfos is, which is uh, down in on the, um, you can see it's kind of on the west coast of uh, the peninsula of Greece. And his move to Italy uh, is indicated by the other two blue spots. All right, so uh, he moved to Italy in 1808 to finish high school in Cremona and study law in the Pavia University. He was part of a literary group of aspiring Italian poets surrounding Ugo Foscolo, a major Italian poet who was also from Zakynthos. Solomos returned to Zakynthos in 1817, and I want to say that Zakynthos, as we know it, is Zakythos. Uh, by people who live there, and it also comes up that way in his writing. So sometimes I'll, I'll say it one way or the other. Uh, and he continued to improvise and write poetry in Italian when he moved back to Greece. Uh, so this is the bicultural thing I was saying. Meanwhile, he studied folk songs and written verse in vernacular Greek with special attention to the poetry of Crete, which was the land of his father's ancestors, and aspired to write in a poetic language rooted in this version of the Greek language. In 1822, Spiridon Trikupis visited Zakynthos. Uh, he was a statesman, um, a Greek statesman from Missolonghi. He would give the funeral oration of Lord Byron two years later and also become the first prime minister of Greece in 1833. But he had a very particular uh, mission when he went to Zakynthos. He sought out very purposefully a meeting with Solomos um, and, and Zakynthos at this point was part of the United States of uh, the Ionian Islands. I'll say more about this. It was a British protectorate, and it remained so until 1864. Okay, so going back to um, Tricupis. Let's see. Here he is. Um, Tricupis uh, appreciated Solomos's poetic gifts, uh, and he knew that... Um, that Greece was in the throes of a Greek, of a Greek war of independence against the Ottoman Empire. We want to say that the Ionian Islands were never part of the, the Ottoman Empire and were not participating in this war. Uh, and he had advice to give to this Italian poet uh, that he should write in Greek. There were plenty of great Greek po uh, poets in Italian, and there wasn't a lot of room on the, at, on, at the top, but in Greek, there was room for a great Greek poet, and he should write about the revolution. So that was his advice, and uh, Dionysio Solomos decided to follow it. So he took up the call, and now uh, we can say, we can look back 200 years ago and uh, note that this was the year when he published his only completed long lyrical poem, the Imnos Iseleferian, the hymn, of free, hymn to Freedom, which was published in Mesolonghi in 1824. Uh, almost immediately on the basis of this one patriotic poem, he became, by popular consensus, the national poet of Greece. And he remained the national poet even after his death in 1857. Um, and the title persists to this day and has everything to do with this one single poem. 158 stanzas, probably the longest national anthem in the world. Uh, all right, um, I don't know that we can all sing all of the stanzas. I think we can maybe sing two of them. Uh, and it, it is an account of the Greek struggle under Ottoman rule and of the outbreak of the War of Independence that was taking place during its writing. Uh, it uses the poetic language of the vernacular, which was the spoken Greek language, and few people were using it to write, publish anything in Greek at that time, so it really stood out for that reason. Um, and then its musical setting by Nikolaos Manzaros in 1827, and again a revised version of it later on, uh, lended it to adoption in 1864 as the national anthem of Greece, and a century later, in 1966 as the national anthem of the Republic of Cyprus. So again, because of this work and this work alone, Solomos is seen to envision and incarnate the ethnic identity, principles, and beliefs of, the Greek, of Greek national culture, unequivocal advocacy for the Greek revolution, embrace of Byronic Philhellenism, interest in Greek folk songs and Greek poetry as monuments of the nation, and absolute dedication to Greek letters. 
Uh, this much, or most of it, is common knowledge in Greece, and likely also to you, and maybe to some people who have attended Greek schools in the United States. Uh, he represents the voice of modern, liberated Greece, as people say, ine o ethnikos mas diikis. He is our national poet. And of course, there's more to the story. <laughs> Uh, as scholars of Greek literature have been pointing out um, over the last 30 and 40 years, beginning with my esteemed colleague, Vasilis Lambropoulos, uh, and continuing to the present. Uh, so the, in scholarship, they be get, people began to question the validity of the assumption that aligned the idea of the national poet of Greece seamlessly with the person and poetry of Solomos. So, now, I'm going to say a few things that maybe some of you know and maybe others do not, okay. Um, so people pointed out that Solomos never set foot in the Greek mainland, um, but lived in increasing isolation for Sinzakynthos and then in Corfu, and I mentioned before that these places were part of the uh, United States of the Ionian Islands until 1864 when the islands, uh, the, the accession to Greece happened, okay? Um, and he had opportunity, but he didn't go. Uh, moreover, his identity was very complex. Having been born Dionysios Salamon from the patrician Venetian noble family Salamon of the Casa Vecchia, or the old houses of the Republic of Venice, he invented the signature, Dionysio Solomos, and you can kind of feel here the, that he's, you know, can't decide if he's writing in Latin script or in Greek script, he has a Greek accent, um, but this is, a, you know, he's not Dionysio Salomon, he's Dionysio Solomos or Di Solomos, and in something between Greek writing and Italian writing. Uh, and uh, precisely to make himself a Greek poet. He was bilingual, bicultural, with Italian as his main language. He wrote Greek incorrectly. I read his Greek and I say, yep, that's a journey that I remember, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I think I'm better. <laughs> Maybe not as a poet, but I think I've got the spelling down. <laughs> okay, he wrote it incorrectly. Um, uh, and although he aspired to gre create great Greek poems, he published no major work in Greek after the hymn to liberty, but wrote multiple unfinished drafts of several unpublished works uh, in which he also incorporated Greek poetic lines into longer Italian prose descriptions of what he wanted uh, to accomplish. Okay, here you can see a little bit of the writing. Um, uh, so in the last years of his life, while uh, living on Corfu, he wrote exclusively in Italian. And Cosandina Zanu's a recent book of 2018, Transnational Patriotism in the Mediterranean, 1800 to 1850, Stammering the Nation, is especially effective in bringing into focus the Italian nexus of Solomos's work and his bicultural intellectual identity. While he did lay the foundations, linguistically, aesthetically, and thematically for Greek, modern Greek poetry, and his poetic account of the events of the revolution impressed its sacred symbols upon the Greek imagination, he always remained outside of it. And as Zanu observes, he was a remarkably odd choice for a national poet of Greece. So my talk today is going to try to reintroduce Solomos within this more complex framework through an interpretation of uh, one of his most enigmatic and uh, unfinished, of course, revolutionary works, which is known as Igineketi Zakynthos, the woman of Zakynthos, and I'll say more about the title. My analysis suggests that Solomos is not so much an odd choice as uh, Kosadina Zanu says, but actually an uncanny one for a Greek national poet. Solomos did not stop thinking about the Greek nation as he observed its emergence and the creation of the Greek state out of the violence of the uprising. Through years of writing, his thinking evolved 
uh, just uh, uh, as the revolution of, and eventually the new Greek state was also evolving. Solomos observed, even from a distance, the challenges people faced when trying to embody freedom, when their own individual so sovereignty was threatened one way or another by another group or by the state. Indeed, his work captured some of the paradoxes of a revolution that was fought to offer liberty but produced competition between groups out of which some people were, deemed, were uh, denied rights of shelter, food, dignity, and even life. He treats the nation as an open question in ways that I think anticipate our own times. So I will focus on this prose poem by Solomos, Zakitos, the woman of Zakynthos, um, which I think represents the complexity of Solomos's body of unpublished writing after the hymn to liberty. It exists, for example, it exists in multiple drafts, all of which are unfinished. Greek is mixed in with Italian in the unfinished parts. The Greek writing is misspelled and often messy and illegible. The work remained unpublished for many years, and it has three subjects, a hieromonk named Dionysios, who is looking for just one righteous person in the ugliness of the world, and I'll read you a passage from that in a little bit, um, an aristocratic woman of Zakynthos who personifies evil by her lack of generosity and her harsh response to people in need, and a group of women who have come from Missolonghi uh, during the second siege to escape destruction and to beg for food. Solomos wrote the first draft in 1826 during the second siege when he claimed, so he's writing right again, right in the middle of events, when he claimed he could hear the cannon fire of the siege from many miles away around 36 miles, and he did not give, the, but he did not give the word this, the work of this title, in fact, he didn't give it any title uh, in its first publication. Um, so instead, what he wrote on a single piece of paper was this note, visione, and again, here we see the Italian mixed with the Greek, visione Dionisio, his own name, eromonacho, the higher monk in Gatiku is Xoclisi uh someone who was living in this small chapel um, in Zakynthos. Um, critical attention is often focused on the evil woman, what kind of evil she personifies, why Solomos wrote about her. My attention turns to the women of Missolonghi, their arrival in Zakynthos, as the inciting event that captures the higher monk's concerns and then their denial of food, respect, and dignity by the aristocratic woman as the beginning of her self-destruction. Um, the work is, I contend, an early example of refugee literature in terms of an, a, a term of recent coinage that refers to writing in the 20th and 21st century, uh, which is what we call the century of the refugees, um, about the person who lives in a state in insecure, of insecurity due to war or persecution. Um, uh, and loses protection of the protection of their political community to become a stateless person forced to navigate a world in which states and people with power um, uh, guard their sovereignty jealously to the point of denying to others their dignity and even their life. In Gineca Tzakythos, a work appearing a hundred years before the century of the refugee began, with the destruction, many of you know this event, the destruction of Smyrna and the major uh, refugee event that that caused with the, um, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the arrival of the Turkish state. Um, so 100 years before that, we see Solomos already beginning to explore something like the refugees' predicament, the profound questions of self and community when people suddenly become the other 
requiring help, and individuals and communities struggle to respond. And again, I think this is something that is very, that is very familiar to us uh, today. My point in reading the work in this way is not to dwell on Solomos's precocity, but to recognize that refugees, according to the 20th century definitions, emerge already within the rise of, of the 19th uh, century state, and to ask under what conditions Solomos, the national poet of Greece, comes to observe them, and what modes of representation he uses to get at a predicament that was vexing Greece then and has been vexing Greece for the past 200 years. Are we doing all right? Okay. So to establish a point of comparison on the subject of refugees with Solomos's work and observe his evolving idea of the nation, let's look at Solomos's representation first in the Hymn to Liberty, the, the well-known work, the published work, and specifically the Greek siege of Tripolitza in 1821, a very major event in the war. Um, in this siege, thousands of Muslim civilians who lived in the villages surrounding Tripolitza in the Peloponnese um, and had saw and sought refuge in the in Tripolitza were then among the 10,000 to 30,000 people massacred by the Greek army. You may remember that the person speaking in uh, the Hymn to Liberty is the poet who addresses liberty. Already in the first stanza, the poet encounters liberty, and here's the, the first stanza, which is, though these are the stanzas that are sung usually as the national anthem, we see him in encountering liberty, a personified divine female figure uh, who drives the action but does not participate in it. Um, so let's just read this stanza. Segnorizo apotikopsi, I know you from the blade, to spasiu di dromeri of the sword, the terrifying blade. Segnorizo apotinopsi, pumedia. I know you from the appearance which by force measures the earth. From the bones taken out, the sacred bones of Greeks. And as first, brave again, rejoice, O oh rejoice, liberty. So the poet is addressing liberty, liberty as a personification as a woman, the figure of a woman, but in an abstract idea. So throughout the poem, he then struggles to keep up with her as she enters negotiating tables or, and battlefields in order to bear witness to the events and recalls past glory to inspire courage and rehearses past suffering to inspire revenge. Because she is an idealized figure, an empty abstraction, she cannot be questioned, but only followed and praised, even in moments when the poet balks. So in this uh, siege of Tripolitza, which the poet narrates, Liberty's march is almost halted by the citadel's massive walls. It is filled, we are told, with soldiers and huddled masses, but we are given no specifics about the non-combatants. With respect to the large number of Muslim, Albanian, Jewish, and non-aligned Christian refugees displaced from their homes in the Pel Peloponnese by the revolutionaries' effort to carve out a space for a free, sovereign Greece, the poem does not even recognize them. Possibly Solomos, who never set foot in the mainland, as I said, uh, did not know about them, but more to the point, the lyrical structure of the poem with its focus on the revivalist asp uh, aspirations of the ancient past doubling as liberty has no place for actual people, their history, and their conflicts, particularly for people on the wrong side of the Greek liberation's cause. Then when the army finds a break in the wall and the massacre begins, agency for the destruction shifts from liberty to the horde of dead Greeks who were victims of prior Turkish violence. 
The dead souls inspire the Greek warriors to take vengeance against the crescent of Islam. Their dance of death whips up the soldiers to a state of frenzy. It brings drama to the narrative of destruction without assigning blame to the living army that executes the massacre. The drama keeps building. The mass massacred people are horrifically represented by severed body parts, um, mutilated legs, arms, and heads in, stanza 60, in line 60, stanza 64, skulls severed or slid in two, brains and steaming, streaming guts, and by extreme emotions everywhere, fright and fear, shouts and sighs, the din of battle, sobs, all over you can hear, and everywhere death rattles. And that's in stanza 870. Although the Greek soldiers seem to be acting, I think I have these, and I'm not quite there. Uh, on behalf of the dead Greeks, they and possibly Liberty, who is absent from the scene, are not exactly absolved. The poet observes rivers of blood pouring into the soil and calls out in horror. Oh, phthani, phthani, eos pote ispotomi. Stop, stop, how long will the killings go on? It is one of the roles of national poets to remind their people of, ideals of, of the ideals of the nation and to bring attention to peril when these are trampled. The underlying tension here is between the Greeks who demand European Enlightenment rights to liberty, justice, and self-determination and sovereignty for themselves, but ignore the ethical means of pursuing it. Moral criticism is felt, but the poet Poet protests, his pro protests barely fill two lines, as you can see, without repercussions. This is a generic limitation of the hymn. It offers the poet no way to question an empty personification. He can only follow and record her forward movement. Liberty reappears to offer Greek Christian Orthodox symbolism to the vi Greek victory. The section ends abruptly with the symbol of the cross rising triumphantly over the conquered citadel of Tripolitsa, followed by a reprise of the poem's recurring second stanza, hailing liberty's rebirth. So taking stock, just before we move on to um, the uh, Yuneka de Zykikos, the woman of Zykikos, uh, the poem lends voice to liberty. Liberty is a female personified abstraction. There are no actual women seen on the ground. The masses cowering inside the walls are undifferentiated. Non-combatants and refugees are among those massacres, but not identified or named. Rules of war are broken, and the poem is silent about these important matters. So Lomosis Yineka de Zaikikos follows a different, um, a different tax, a tax. So I'm going to go back to this page. This is, to be sure, a multi-layered, unfinished, obscure text that bears many readings. Um, there are compl complicating factors, the unfinished drafts of 1829, 1830. 1829, 1833, and another that was started in 1833 and that wasn't finished, the mixtures of Italian and Greek, large skips in the numbering, suggesting big unwritten passages, sections that don't fit. These are some of the complications. Um, but I want to take my cue from the, the, this title, the descriptive title quoted above, um, uh, which uh, I think um, it because I think that the, the, the published title, Yineka de Zakikos, is misguided. It is the vision of Dionisio Eromonajo as the narrator, a double for the poet, a witness to repercussions of the siege of Missolonghi, and a visionary of the, tragedy, of, of the tragedy that is to come, that is the subject of the poem. Uh, and as a narrator, he is quite different from the poet of the hymn to liberty. The lyrical voice is biblical and written in prose verses that hit at, hint at the book of Revelation. He is concerned with how people conduct their lives, but the insights are social and political, turning on the question of justice. 
and he asked the question, how many just people are there? So let me read a passage for you, all right? Um, this is at the very beginning of the poem, and it is quite dramatic, I think. And I'm going to read it in English, but I might read some parts of it in Greek. I, Dionysius the Anchorite, of the chapel of St. Lipios, I say, being resolved to set forth what is on my mind, I was just returning from the monastery of St. Dionysius, whither I had gone to speak with a monk of certain spiritual matters. It was summer, and it was a time when water waters grow turbid, and I had come to the place called Three Wells, and the earth around the well was covered in water, for the women go there often to do their washing. Already we're hearing about women. I stopped at one of the three wells, and I placed my hand on the rim of the well and leaned forward to see if there was no water. And I saw that it was filled to the middle, and I said, praise be to God. Sweet is the freshness that he sends to men's vittles in summertime. Great are his works, and great is man's thanklessness. But the just, according to holy scriptures, how many are they? And as I pondered this, my eyes fell upon my hands, which were placed on the rim. And wishing to count the just on my fingers, I raised my left hand from the rim and looked at the fingers of the right one. And I said, would they be too many? And I started to compare the number of the just that I knew with these five fingers. And seeing that they were too many, I made one less by hiding my little finger uh, be uh, between the rim and the palm of my hand. And I stood looking at the four fingers for a long time, and I felt great agony of spirit, for I knew that I would be constrained to diminish their number. And next to my little finger, I put the neighbor in the same position. So there remained under my eyes three fingers only, and I drummed them restlessly on the rim to help my mind discover at least three just men. But since my innards began to tremble like the sea, which is never stilled, I raised my three poor fingers and crossed myself. Then, wishing to count the unjust, I thrust one hand in the pocket of my cossack and the other in my girdle, for I understood, alas, that my fingers would, not, would be of no use at all. So um, that gives you a sense, not of the Greek, epitathelondas nari thmiso tus adikus echosa to keri mes ti zepi, tu rasumu, ke to alo anamesa sto zonari mu, yeti ekatalava alimono posta dachtila den kriazondan onotela. So, um, and I want to say, like just listening to that Greek, it is very, very revolutionary for his time that he's writing in that language. Okay. So I think we have a sense of him and his voice and the, very, the specificity of the voice, but also his concern about righteousness and justice, but a righteousness that has to do with how people behave in relationship uh, to each other. Um, let's see, where was I? So uh, the monk's investigation of the question of justice has no personified idealized guide. He's on his own. And he traverses his small island universe observing and recording the current state of things, his own struggle to find, uh, a, to find a just person. Um, let's recall again uh, the, sorry, let's see. Um, so uh, the current state of things, how the spillover of the Greek Revolution on the mainland is affecting human society, on the semi-independent, 
United States of the Ionian Islands, which were never part of the uh, Ottoman struggle. The events he focuses on concern two actors who were in conflict. The women of Mesolonghi who had crossed over the Gulf of Patras to beg for food and for supplies as the siege of their hometown was, re was wearing on, and the aristocratic woman of Zakynthos who denies them food and sends them away from her home. So we're going to follow this now. Um, Dionisio Edo Monaco bears witness to both actors and is particularly attentive to the scene of failed hospitality and, his and its consequences. His prophetic vision of the catastrophic fall of Missolonghi and the suicide of the woman of Zakynthos comes after the women of Missolonghi have begged for food, been denied uh, food and shelter, and uh, left the woman of Zakynthos' home. So I want to say that women play a vital role in the story. We first hear about them as coming to the well and water uh, being all around the well because women were going to coming and getting water. Uh, they are social and even political actors. Um, there's the woman of Zakynthos, whom uh, uh, Dionysius Hieromong deems entirely without good. Ke echthisa thanasima tu ethnus, very important line, a deadly enemy of the nation. Um, now, and I want to say that critics have concentrated on her grotesque figure to read the work either as a satirical representation or an allegorical figuration of evil. Um, but his characterization of her as envious, vindictive, highly sexualized, unpatriotic, ungenerous, transgressive, surely matters, and many r readings of the work make important contributions to our understanding of her departure from social norms. But the work's fixation on the evil in her, I think, must be read in the light of the narrator's attention to the actual historical crisis presented by the women of Missolonghi's arrival on the island in 1826 when he was drafting the poem, when Dionys Solomos was drafting the poem. So how are they represented? They're a social group, but also actual women and concretized. We learned that, we learned that they were women of property who left behind what they owned when they aligned themselves in the siege against the Ottomans. So they took a stand in their town uh, and their property was threatened by this stand. Um, to reach Zakynthos then, they had traveled 30 nautical miles, 33 miles. Um, they had to cross not only the sea, but what was a boundary between the Ottoman Empire and the now semi-autonomous United States of the Ionian Islands. Um, so they were leaving behind their political and linguistic community, their hometown, the place where they uh, felt comfortable. In the second draft, as edited by Eleni Tansanoglu, there are details of tumult in the city when more boats arrive on the shore of Zakynthos with children and old men and people from the city gathering on the shore. Uh, we feel the rumblings of the bombardment of Missolonghi. We observe how intimately the women um, appear uh, in, in their arrival and um, the shift in their position from being in charge of their livelihood and possession to becoming refugees. The narrator humanizes them. He describes how putting out their hand to beg did not come easily to them. I'm going to read a little bit of this. At first, they kept their hands close to their body, um, and they were not ready to beg because they'd never done it before. And they waited until the day passed and only did it in the dark. It's just an incredible detail. And gradually, he tells us, they lost their shame. Thus, we are given to understand that in addition to the scenes of combat, loss of loved ones, and starvation, they had suffered becoming beggars and scroungers uh, and costing them their identity. Though ethnically and religiously similar to the people in Zakynthos in their situation as refugees from a besieged and contested homeland on the other side of a boundary, they were radically other to the people of Zakynthos, uh, people from another polity who were seeking assistance and refuge but had no ground to stand on except mercy particularly because assisting the revolutionaries in the Ionian island at that time 
was forbidden by the British authorities who were supposedly protecting this protectorate, this British protectorate. And people like the woman of Zykynthos, a woman of high class, were intent on retaining their class and their relationships and their independence in the British protectorate. So the sequence involving the women of Missolonghi takes up four long sections at the center of the work in the second draft, uh, or nearly the whole of the poem, or half, sorry, half of the poem. They gather on the beach and the detailed account of their learning to beg is given there in section three. And I'm, I, I'm gonna hold off on that, but go into the next section. Um, then there's the arrival of more refugees by boat. This is a very drafty section of the poem, Italian, Greek, lines that are unfinished, but you can tell that this is supposed to indicate that the siege is failing and these people are now becoming, like truly becoming refugees from a homeland that doesn't exist anymore. And then we see the scene of the women begging at the house of the woman of Zykynthos and the poet's observation of them then again when they return to the shore. So I'm gonna read from this section, which is when they um, go to the, the house of the, uh, of the woman of Zykynthos, the busy um, aristocratic woman. And so we'll get a little bit of her here. Meanwhile, the woman of Zykynthos had her daughter on her knees and was trying to cosset her. Uh, when the crazy woman pushed the hair disheveled by her restlessness back into her, behind her ears and said, kissing her daughter, my darling, my pretty, my good girl, get married and we'll go out and come back together, look at people, sit together in the window, read the Bible, the thousand and one nights. And she caressed her and kissed her eyes and lips and put her in a chair telling her there, Take a look in the little mirror and see how pretty you are and how much you look like me. And the daughter, who was not used to this kind of kindness from her mother, became quiet and tears of joy came to her eyes. And all at once, there was a clatter of feet growing louder and louder. Que idu megali tarahipo dion opu pandotes afxene. And she stood still, staring at the door, flaring her nostrils. And there appeared before her the women from Missolonghi. They put their right hand on their breast and bowed their head. And they remained silent and motionless. So that's it? What would you like us to do? Is this a game? What are your orders, ladies? You made such a noise with your clogs coming up, and I think you came to give me orders, the woman. They all remained silent and motionless, but one said, you are right. You are in your own country, in your own house, and we are strangers. We need a helping hand. And the woman of Zakynthos interrupted her and answered, my lady schoolmistress, you have lost everything, but from what I hear, you have kept your tongue. I am in my own country and my own house, and wasn't your ladyship in your own country and your own house? What are you lacking, and what harm did the Turk do to you? Didn't you leave your food, servants, gardens, riches? And you had more than I, God be thanked. Did I ask you to fight the Turks? Did I come now to beg? Uh, did you come now to beg from me and insult me? Yes, indeed. You came out of doors to do brave deeds. You, the women, were fighting a fine sight you'd have made with guns and skirts. And did you put on breeches? And at first you fared well, as the unfortunate Turkish lads were taken by surprise. And how could the Turk have suspected such treachery? Was it God's will? Did you not mingle with the Turk day and night? It would be the same if I thrust a knife at dawn into my husband's throat, devil take him. And now that things are going badly with you, you want the burden to fall on me. That's a good one to be sure. Tomorrow, Missolonghi falls. The kings on whom I rest all my hopes will put mad Greece in order. 
and those who survive the slaughter come to Zakynthos to be fed by us, and with full bellies, they insult us. She fell silent for a moment and, and looked the women of Mesolonghi straight in the eye. I can talk too, yes or no? What are you waiting for? Perhaps you found some pleasure in listening to me? You have nothing better to do than go begging, and I think, to tell the truth, that it's a pleasure for those who have no shame. I'm busy, do you hear? I'm busy. And as she shouted such things, she no longer seemed a coffee pot, no more than three spans tall, but a normal woman, and in her anger, she stood on her tiptoes, and barely touching the floor, her eyes popped out of their sockets, and her sound eye appeared to squint, and her squinting eye appeared sound, and she became like a plaster mask that painters cast with the faces of the dead in order to, and it breaks off there, um, and et cetera. All right, so you got a sense of the, the scene, which I think is really quite, um, quite remarkable. I hope that you enjoyed that. All right. So, uh, so we, that's the begging of the women in the house of the woman of Zakynthos, who has very good arguments, I want to say, that sound very contemporary as well. And then we have the poet observing them again on the shore uh, and the vision of the fall of Missolonghi, and then the woman of Zakynthos' self-destruction. At the end, she, um, she basically you know, commits suicide by missing herself. This dramatic scene of their request to help for help from the woman of Zakynthos and her refusal at the center of the poem, which, as I noted above, need, um, I need special, special attention. It is the moral equivalent of that line that we looked at just a little bit before. Oops. Uh, oh, shiny, shiny, oh, spote, iskotomi, stop, stop. How long will the killings go on in the hymn of liberty? But it is much more fully and effectively elaborated. It occupies me here uh, because it eloquently shows the social predicament of the women of Mesolonghi uh, presented to the Zakithian society and more broadly to the emergent nation state of Greece. They are, as I said before, now the other generated by the national revolutionary uprising who depend on people like the woman of the independent state of Zakynthos to fulfill their human needs and rights. But the woman who receives them does not recognize the grounds of their request and sees them as clashing with her sovereignty. And this is a classic situation of failed hospitality as described in the homonymous essay by Jacques Derrida, Hospitality, in which the ideal of absolute hospitality as a test of humanity becomes a test of the limits of human societies to guarantee people's safety and at the same time to regulate themselves. According to Derrida, the scene of hospitality requires at least three people, the host, the guest, and the person who bears witness. The woman of Zakynthos, the host, is busy attending to herself in her home when she hears the clutter of, clatter of feet approaching. The women of Mesolonki have entered her household as guests. The Onisio uh, Iromonaco remains a witness and records the scene from a doorway. The women address the women, woman addresses the women of Mesolonghi sarcastically. What game are they playing? Fezuna, that's the that's her words. Is this a game in which women have lost their property? Who have lost their property give orders to someone who still has hers? One woman steps forth to grant her the distinction of lady of the house and appeals for her help. The woman then uh, does not accept the relationship as described. They were once lady too, she reminds them, and they willingly gave up their status for a cause that she doesn't support. She feels no responsibility for the decisions they made to fight the Turks, which she considers treachery against their rulers. If they lost their security and property, they should not count on people in another polity to pay the price. She calibrates the cost of their decision and refuses to pay. Her argument is political, and cuts to the core of the predicament of refugees of the evolving geopolitical moment. 
in which states recognize the right of someone persecuted in their home to seek asylum, but reserve the right of sovereign control to reject the cause. Her argument reaches its end when she announces, I'm busy, busy do you hear, and cast them out. The women are in no position to argue back. They retreat from her house without a sound. As a witness, Dionisios Iromonajos, who I want to say is a stand-in for the poet, Dionisios Solomos, has made the women, woman of Zaikintho sound as if she were a man cogently arguing a case in a law court. But he represents her female body as becoming elongated and actually disfigured as she stands on her toes to make herself taller, as if to fill shoes of a male citizen. She compares her face, he compares her face to a plaster mask of the dead, prefiguring her suicide at the end of the work. She is a woman in conflict, one who articulates in a manly way what will become over the next two centuries a recurring argument of refu refusing asylum and at the same time betrays the traditionally female role of offering domestic hospitality. By betraying her role, she betrays the rule of society to guarantee human freedom and sends the women on, sorry, to guarantee human safety and sends the women on to continue their traumatic quest for aid. Dionisio Iromonajos here reprises the role of the national poet that we saw in passing in the hymn to liberty to remind people of the ideal of society. But here, as I have suggested, the articulation of the peril of refusing hospitality is fraught with tension. Taking stock, and I'm almost done, taking stock of Solomos's Woman of Zakynthos, in order to bring this talk to a close, I observe an experimental work that places women at the center of the nation's drama, not as abstractions, but humanized to a good degree. Somewhat awkwardly, they are seen as political actors at the center of a new type of drama in which non-combatants of a national cause who are pushed out of their homes reach out to fellow humans in another polity for help, and those people struggle to respond. Solomos's experimentation with the new subject may ex explain in part the generic difficulty of this work and his own difficulty in finishing it but it is also a sign of the difficulty of a new political problem that begins with the rise of nations. Greece, we want to remember, is one of the earliest uh, to rebel and to rebel in terms of nationhood um, that recurs in our own time. Is it possible for nations which prodigiously produce refugees to find ways of absorbing them and how can literature rise to the challenges of representing them? In returning to Solomos's poem, Yenek of Zakynthos, to read it as refugee literature, I have been pushing against a long tradition of reading Solomos as a national poet of a single work with no development. And Solomos's later work as that of a person who is odd for a national poet. By shifting the focus, we discover um, women of Mesolonghi and their dramatic predicament as refugees witnessed by Dionisio Iromonojo, but also by Solomos. Uh, I'm arguing, suggesting that it is time to take up questions of gender and refugees when we look at nations in the making, and also to recognize that the work of this national poet uh, speaks to our own century as it is touched it touches on problems that pay, plague our own conscience and finds no easy solutions um, as we do not find them in our own day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, thank you for weaving this thread between literature and history to, to strike this note of humanity. And unfortunately, we live in, an, uh, in a period, in an era where we tend to forget and ignore the unhappiness and the plight of our fellow human beings. And in reality, we really have lost, I fear, the ability to empathize and to feel for tragedy we ignore tragedy until it hits very close to home. And what makes us as human beings? Uh, what you presented today is a striking reminder 
of our need to empathize with other people. And thank you for, for reminding us of that. Uh, Professor Leontis is available to answer